Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord. We can do better than that. I said, Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this hour. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the message of Christ. Thank you for our salvation. We're asking, Lord, that what you say to us now will remind us of the message that came and saved us. And the message we need to take to the world so that everyone that hears will give their lives to the Lord and be saved. Quicken us by your spirit and quicken the word in every heart, in every life. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming back to our man, our minister, our prophet, Jonah. Renewed, restored, refined, recommissioned to take the message from the mouth of the Lord and take to the people. We're coming to Jonah chapter 3 and I'm reading from verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time saying, then in verse 2 it says, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Look at verse 3. Then it says, So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. Then in verse 4 we are told, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. As we look at this passage right now, we're looking at the same message for the same world from the same Savior. The world is still the same spiritually. The world is still the same in the sense that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And all are sinning today. The world at large. And they have come short of the glory of God. When Christ was here, John reminded us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And the world is still loved by the Lord, that still today God still so loves the world. He has given his only begotten Son so that we will go and tell the world, and as the people believe, or have everlasting life, they will not perish. And is giving us the same calling, the same Savior, saving the same world, the same kind of world, and giving us the same message that will reach out to them. We're looking at three points in this message. Number one, the source of mercy for the sinner's salvation. Number two, the sacrifice of the mediator for our salvation. And number three, the substance of the message of salvation. Let's come to number one. Number one, we're looking at the source of mercy for the sinner's salvation. As you look at Jonah chapter four, reading from verse two, Jonah said, I pray thee, I he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my sin when I was yet in my country? Wherefore, therefore, I fled before unto Tashish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful. I know thou art a gracious God and merciful. 
merciful. I knew that it is by grace we are saved, not by works. And I know once I preach to those people, you're a gracious God. That is your nature, the nature of God, gracious in the past and gracious today and gracious forever. By grace are we saved, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. And I know your manifold mercies, that your manifest mercy, it says that I knew that you are merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thou, relentest thou of the evil, the source of mercy for the sinner's salvation. Look at three things here. Number one, the mercy of God in the sinner's salvation. Number two, is the ministration of grace for the soul's salvation. Number three, the might of God on our sure salvation number one number one the mercy of god in the sinner's salvation look at ephesians chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 4 ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 but god who is rich in mercy that's what jonah was saying he said i knew i knew you will save those people you are, you don't you are not interested in the death of the sinner God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, even when we were dead in sins and he has quickened us together with Christ by grace are ye saved. In Micah chapter 7, reading there from verse 18. Micah 7 verse 18 who is a God like unto thee, that partners iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, even on Nineveh. He retaineth not his anger forever. Look at this, because he delighted in mercy. Because he delighted in mercy. That's the source of our salvation. Because God is a merciful God. It's a gracious God. Once we turn to God, the Lord meets us with mercy. Look at verse 19. It says in verse 19, it will turn again. It will have compassion upon us. It will subdue our iniquities and thou wilt cast all their sins into to the depths of the sea. In First Timothy chapter 1, reading there from verse 14, here Paul the apostle said, And the grace of our Lord was succeeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 15, it says, This is the faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ came into this world, into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Then in verse 16, it says, How be it? Because for this cause I obtained mercy. Not marriage, I obtained mercy. If those people got it by mercy, then Nineveh can get it by the mercy of God. That mercy of God is the source of our salvation. It says, uh, it, it says, it's of mercy that in me for Jesus Christ my show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Let's look at number two there. Number two is talking about the ministration of grace in the soul's salvation. If we're going to get people saved and jolt them and turn them from their sin and turn them to the Savior, we need to talk about the grace of God. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. God's redemption at Christ's expense. Gr grace. It is God's righteousness at Christ's expense. In the expense, Christ paid it all on the cross of Calvary. And we're talking about that grace. It says in uh, Acts chapter 15, uh, verse 11. But we believe that through grace, 
that through grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we, the Jews, shall be saved even as they. Those Gentiles, those Ninevites, can also be saved, will also be saved through this same message of the grace of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 8, it says, For by grace, remember again that grace is God's redemption and God's riches at Christ's expense. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, not the works that I've done, not the labor, not the dues I paid, not the money I gave to the church, not the building I gave to the church. It is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. If it is the gift of God, we don't buy it. We don't buy it with religious ceremony, religious rite, religious rituals, religious dogma. We don't buy it with any religious human effort. It says that not of yourselves. It is is the gift of God. It says in verse 9, in verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is of the grace of God. We're looking at number 3 here. Number 3 is the might of God on our sure salvation. What's the might of God? Now you are saying Jonah. And he told Jonah, tell them 40 days respite and Nineveh shall be destroyed if there is no repentance. What's really the mind of God? In Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9, here we see the mind of God. It says, God is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. But is long suffering, long suffering towards what? Not willing that any should perish. Not willing that any should perish. Not willing that Nineveh shall perish. Jonah, you have the same mind of God. Not willing that any tribe in our country, any tribe in our state shall perish. Preacher, do you have that mind? Not, uh, not willing that any province of any country of any nation shall perish. And preachers, do we have that mind? Here is the mind of God. It's not willing that any should perish, but that all all, all shall come to repentance. It tells us in Ezekiel chapter 18, reading from verse 32, For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies. And Jonah came to that city. Jonah, what are you thinking about? Well, I'm talking to them. I'm telling them, Forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown, shall be destroyed. Now, Jonah, what's your mind? Uh, well, I'm a prophet. I want God to prove me as a true prophet. I told them 40 days, just less than, uh, less than six weeks, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Well, the mind of God actually is sent you to warn them so that they will think about their ways and they will turn and they will repent. And if they repent, the real mind of God will show us is not willing that anybody in Nineveh should be destroyed. Anybody in our congregation, anybody in our locality, anybody in our tribe, God is not willing that anyone should perish. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies, says the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye where we we'll live in Jesus' name. Jeremiah chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 7. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck it up and to pull it down and to destroy it, Jonah should have read all these conditional promises, utterances of God in going to Nineveh. And he shouldn't have been offended because God created all those Ninevites, anybody living on earth, 
anybody living in your neighborhood, any living, anybody living in your tribe, or in other people's tribes. Those tribes may be different from our tribe. Their peculiarities will be different from our own peculiarities. And their focus in life may be different. And they may kind of, they may rob us the other way. We may not be happy with them, but we must remember that all these people, whether they are near or far, whether they are like us or not like us, whether they look like like us or not, whether they dress like us or not, all these creatures were created by God. And because they are the offspring of his hand, he doesn't want anyone to perish. Therefore, he says, at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. Look at verse 8. If that nation against whom I have pronounced and had given what looks like the final sentence. If that nation turn from their evil, I will repent, I will relent, I will change my mind of the evil that I thought to do unto them. That's the reason why God used his prerogative and his love, and his compassion, and his mercy. When he saw that those people turned, that's what he was after. They were wicked. Because of the wickedness, you'll be destroyed within 40 days. And now, they looked at it, and they dropped the wickedness in their hand. That's all God is looking for, and that's why he forgave them. And we're looking at Romans now chapter 10. We're reading from verse 9. Romans chapter 10. We're reading from verse 9. It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. In any community, in any tribe, in any nation, in any denomination, in any church circle, in any religious circle, if that individual will confess with his mouth the Lordship of Jesus and shall believe in his heart that God has raised him from the dead, that person will be saved. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. The repentance must come from the heart. The turning around must come from the heart. And owning him as Lord, confessing him as Lord, must come from the heart. What the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then in verse 13, it tells us in verse 13, for whosoever, whosoever, anywhere, in whichever land, in whichever nation, even in Nineveh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I pray as you go forth and you present the clear message of repentance, of forgiveness, of regeneration, of conversion, of salvation to people anywhere, everywhere, the Lord will turn their hearts unto himself in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We come to point number two here now. Point number two. The sacrifice of the mediator for our salvation. The sacrifice of the mediator for our salvation. We're looking at uh, First Timothy chapter 2 verse 3. It says, for this is good. And acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. And then in verse 4, it says, Who will have all men to be saved? No partiality, no discrimination, no setting apart this. God has not ordained anyone for destruction, anyone for hell anyone to be lost forever and ever the sacrifice of christ is not a limited atonement 
It is a universal atonement that is for everyone. It is not for the Jews. It's also for the Gentiles. It is not for the elect. It is for everyone who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Then he tells us in verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Verse 6 now tells us, Who gave himself a ransom for all. Jews and Gentiles, a ransom for all. Jerusalem and Nineveh, he gave himself for all to be testified in good time. We're dividing this to three parts. Number one, the sacrifice of the mediator is for all sinners. Number two, the suffering of the Messiah is for all souls. Number three, the supplication of the master is to make all saints number one number one the sacrifice of the mediator is for all sinners look at this in isaiah chapter 53 and we're reading from verse 4 surely he christ he the savior he our mediator surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him smitten, stricken of God, and afflicted. Look at verse 5. It says, But he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with the stripes we are healed. Amen. Then. Now, when you said our transgression, who are the ours there? When you say we, who are the we there? Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it tells us all. And look at the last word there, us all. All at the beginning, all at the end. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Nineveh, all the people had turned their own way. Jonah, he had turned his own way. If God forgave Jonah, God will forgive Nineveh. If God forgave the preacher, the pastor, the proclaimer, God will forgive and have mercy on those poor people in Nineveh. All, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him on the mediator on the Messiah on the one that died for us the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all the same mercy that saved you will save them the same grace that came to you and saved you will save them and the same compassion the same love that came to you when you were in sin now you are saved now you are a son now you are a servant of god that same grace that came to you will come to them he has laid on him the iniquity of us all that's why it says in Isaiah chapter 55, looking at verse 6, seek ye, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Now, Nineveh, Nineveh, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Between now and 40 days, the probation the Lord hath given you, seek the Lord. During these 40 days, Nineveh, and seek ye the Lord while he may be found, and call ye upon him while he is near. What's the Lord looking for? Look at verse 7. In verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way, and the righteous man his thoughts, and let him return 
unto the Lord. That's all you want. That's all you want. You've gone after idols. Return unto the Lord. You've gone after the God of this world. Return unto the Lord. You've gone after greed. And you're searching and you want this. You grab this. You grab that. And you're gambling with your life. It says return. All you want return. Return from your greed. And return from your evil. And return from your sinfulness. And return from the jungle and the wilderness of sinning. And when we return to the Lord, it says, let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy. That's the word again. Mercy. Where could we be without mercy? Where could, what could we do without mercy? How can we have salvation without mercy? He will have mercy upon him at our God for he will abundantly pardon. That's why the Lord said, go ye into all the world and preach the good news, the gospel to every creature. We're coming to number two here. Number two, the suffering of the Messiah for all souls. The suffering of the Messiah for all souls. We're looking at First John chapter 3 and I'm reading from verse 4. First John chapter 3, we're looking at verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Whosoever has committed sin from Adam to Eve to Abel to Cain and to all the people that lived in those generations until now all have sinned and come short of the glory of God we cannot uh, gloat over the sins of other people as if we ourselves were free we were sinners it's mercy that recalled us it's mercy that redeemed us it's mercy that has brought us unto the Lord for this for sin is the transgression of the Lord. Look at verse 5. It says, And ye know, Jonah, you know. And preacher, you know. Paul, John, James, Peter, you all know. And we ought to know. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. He didn't come to condemn us. He didn't come to judge us. He didn't come to say, here is your limit. You are gone. No, we know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. John chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 14. John chapter 3, we're looking at verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man, that's the Messiah, that's the Mediator, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Why? In verse 15, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. So simple, so straightforward, that whosoever, anytime, anywhere, in any nation, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We have it. Eternal life, we have eternal life. But I'm not going to a Pentecostal church whosoever believeth in him. But I'm not going to the best, uh, gracious, loving church in town. That's not your problem. Your problem is your choice. Your choice, personal, that whosoever, anywhere you live, anywhere you go, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Congratulations, you will not perish. Yeah. As we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him will believe, will believe now, we keep on believing and we don't turn away from our faith in Christ. We keep on believing, believers in him to the last moment and the last hour should not perish but have 
everlasting life. We're looking at number three here. Number three, the supplication of the master is to make all saints. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 7. And we're reading from verse 25. Hebrews chapter 7. Reading from verse 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. Whatever your trial, whatever your temptation, whatever your territory, wherever you are coming from, whatever your weakness, God is able, Christ is able with all those trials, all those temptations, and all the things that come across your way. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever live to make intercession for them. Do you often remember that Christ, the Savior, is making supplication, making intercession, prayers for you? Christ is praying for me. I said, Christ is praying for me. I thought you'd say it by yourself. For yourself. And you believe that. Christ is praying for you. And his prayer for you will not be in vain in Jesus' name. Anytime you face temptation, anytime you face trial, anytime you face difficulty, and you say, how am I going to go out of this? Remember, Christ is praying for you. And Jesus said, Father, I know you hear me and you hear me always. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, it tells us, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, on the fault, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. And his prayer for you, for me, for us all, will be answered in Jesus' name. Look at uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4. We're looking at verse 7. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7. Here he tells us, For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. That's what God has called us to. And that's what Jesus is praying for. And Jesus will confirm it in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. His prayer can make us saints. His prayer can make us sound and healthy. His prayer can make us sanctified, steadfast, solid, and stable. And I pray the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ will bring saintliness and holiness out of your life in Jesus' name. We come to point number three now. Point number three is the substance of the message of salvation the message of salvation we go out and god said unto jonah and he said go preach that same preaching that i beat thee let's look at that jonah chapter 3 we're reading from verse 1 and the word of the lord came unto jonah the second time saying look at verse 2 in verse 2 arise go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee, the preaching I gave you, the preaching I commanded you, and the preaching I told you, go tell them. When you get to Nineveh, don't take a jot out, don't add any jot. When you get to Nineveh, don't diminish and don't add your own opinion. That same message I gave you, the message of salvation. That's what he tells us to go and tell them. Now, what message are we to preach as we go to our Nineveh, as we go to a point of ministry? Look at this. A, it's accept the atonement of Christ. That's all. 
Christ has atoned for the sins of the whole world. And we're going to them, we reveal that atonement to them, and we say, don't think of your works, don't think of your activity, don't think of your action, don't think of your inaction, don't think of your sin, don't think of any other sin, accept the atonement of Christ. We're looking at Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 11. Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received, we have accepted the atonement. Be believe and be born again through Christ. Be believe and be born again through Christ because he tells us in John chapter 1 verse 12 he says for as many as received him to them he gave power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name that's what we we'll go out to tell them we're not telling them to change this and change that to cross over from here to there and we're not to turn over a new leaf no we're telling them believe and be born again because it says in john chapter 3 reading from verse 3 it tells us jesus answered and said unto him verily verily i say unto thee except a man be born again born again he cannot see the kingdom of god he accepts the atonement of christ he believes and is born again by christ see confess and be converted to Christ because he tells us in first John chapter 1 verse 9 he says if we confess our sins if we confess our sins if we honestly and if we faithfully and if we passionately and if we are convicted of those things if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from from all unrighteousness. That's what we do. We come and we confess, and we are now converted to Christ. Because in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Acts 3, verse 19, repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. A B, C, D, decide and depend only on Christ. De decide and depend only on Christ. The message needs a final decision. You either accept or reject. And if you accept the atonement, if you believe so you can be born again, if you confess and you are converted to Christ, believe and depend only on Christ. It tells us in Acts chapter 4, reading from verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We must be saved if we're going to get to heaven. We must be saved if we're going to have reconciliation with God. We must be saved if we're going to enjoy the fellowship of God in his family and the only way to do that is to decide and depend only on Christ he embraced the exaltation of Christ embrace the exaltation of Christ you have to put down all other gods you have to put down all other ideologies you have to put down all other opinions and then you embrace the exaltation of Christ in Philippians chapter 2 reading from verse 9 Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 wherefore God also has highly exalted him 
God, the God of heaven, the Father of heaven and earth, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Look at verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth and then in verse 11 it says that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father to be saved then you need to understand that all the angels at lower, all the men at lower, and there is no salvation, there's no way of salvation in any angel and in any man, in anybody like the founder of any religion, the founder of any denomination, in Moses, in Joshua, in David, in Elijah, in Elisha, in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, there is no salvation in Peter, Paul, or John, Christ. And Christ alone has been highly exalted that now you will confess with your mouth, believe from your heart that Jesus is your Lord to the glory of the Father. If follow the footsteps of Christ. You want to be saved? Look at Christ. Looking unto Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. And as you understand that Christ is the only name recognized in heaven for salvation and is the only life led through the glory of God if you follow the footsteps of Christ. In First Peter, reading from chapter 2 and verse 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye shall follow his steps. Ye should follow his steps. And then ye grow in the grace of Christ. What brought us in is what will keep us in. The grace of God brought us into the kingdom. And it is that same grace of God that will keep us in the kingdom it tells us in second peter chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 18 second peter chapter 3 verse 18 but grow in grace but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ to him be glory both now and forever and the whole church said amen, amen. We have the grace of God. We recognize the grace of God. We're called through the grace of God. We're converted through the grace of God. It's of grace and not of works that we are saved. And now we grow in the knowledge, in the understanding, in the appreciation of that grace of God. Each hope of heaven through Christ. Hope of heaven through Christ. You ask somebody, uh, when you die, where are you going to? He says, I'm going to heaven. How could you say that so confidently? Because I go to church every Sunday. Is that so? Because I pay my tithes and offering. I'm going to heaven because I've done this, because I'm doing that. You understand? Our hope of heaven is only in Christ. You are not as perfect as an angel. And you are not as perfect as perfection as demanded. If you get to heaven, it's only through Christ as a forerunner. And when you hide yourself in him, and say nothing in my hand, I bring simply, I, I cling to the cross, Christ. And Christ alone could save me. Hope of heaven through Christ. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, if in this life only for healing and for prosperity and for success and for provision, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are 
of all men most miserable. Our hope of getting to heaven is in Christ. In First Peter chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, according to his abundant mercy, according to his inexhaustible mercies, has begotten us again unto a lively hope. According to his abundant mercy, he has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then in verse 4, he tells us to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away. Look at this. Reserved in heaven for you, that's our hope. When you believe on Christ, when you take Christ as the Savior and the only Savior, when you take Christ as Savior, the unique Savior, the universal Savior, and the incomparable Savior, and the irreplaceable Savior, then it says that inheritance that is not corruptible, that inheritance that cannot be defiled, that inheritance that will not fade away is reserved in heaven for you and then in verse 5 who are catch by the power of God through faith unto salvation final salvation unto salvation eternal salvation ready to be revealed in the last time I imputed with innocence through Christ. The impartation and the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. That's a salvation. We cannot bring a filthy rags, a self-righteousness unto God and say, God, look at this one uh, friend. How comest thou here not having the wedding garment? Take him and throw him out. We must have the garment, his own garment, the robe of righteousness that is washed and cleansed and made white in the blood of the Lamb, imputed with innocence through Christ. We're looking at Romans. I'm looking at chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. We're looking at verse 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Blessed is the man that knows that our redemption, our salvation is in Christ. And then he throws away his own self-righteousness. And he takes on the righteousness of Christ. Blessed is that man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And then he tells us in verse 11, in verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed. Righteousness, the kind of righteousness approved of God, approved of heaven, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And then he tells us in verse 22 there, in verse 22, he says, and therefore it was imputed unto him righteousness. Verse 23, in verse 23, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed unto him. In verse 24, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. J, joyful in the justification of Christ. Joyful, full of joy in the justification 
of Christ. The only way we can be justified and acquitted, and the only way we can be set free, that no more judgment, that our sins that have been judged on Christ will not be judged on us again, is that we lean on Christ, we believe in Christ. Romans chapter 5, we're reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only means, that's the only source, that's the only way of our salvation. It says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it tells us by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, K, we are kept by the kindness of Christ. We came in by His grace. We are kept by the kindness of Christ. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 7. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us. That's how we get saved. That's how we keep saved. Because we're kept by the kindness of Christ. The kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. And then he follows by that verse. We all know in verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God look at Titus chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 4 Titus chapter 3 verse 4 after that the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward us toward man appeared the kindness of God through Jesus Christ appeared unto us. That's how we get saved. Hell liberated by the love of Christ. Liberated by the love of Christ. We need to assure the people we're preaching to that as they get saved, they're not liberated in their own strength, in their own power, by their own trial, by turning over a new leaf. They're not liberated because I do this, I do this, I stop doing this, I stop doing that. We're liberated by the love of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're reading here from verse 14, for the love of of Christ for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all he died for all then were all dead because it is that kindness and it is that love it is that liberation that has set us free and then the result of that is in verse 17 in verse 17 therefore if any man liberation but the love of Christ be in creature, be in Christ. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. It's the liberation of Christ by his love that makes all things new in our lives. And in verse 21, it says, For he has made him to be seen, to be the sin offering for us who knew no sin that we might be made, we might be made by that love of Christ, we might be made the righteousness of God in him. M made meet, made suitable, made fit, made meet by the mediation of Christ made meet by the mediation of Christ. Hebrews chapter 9, we're reading from verse 15. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, and for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, of the New Pact, of the New Agreement, of the New Covenant, that by means of death, 
for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the false covenant. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. It is by his mediation that all that happens and new through the newness in Christ. We come to Christ and the new life. The new life is not uh, what we conjure. It is not what we make an effort. I will try. I will try. I will try. It's not try but trust. You trust him and because of that, that new life comes by the newness we have in Christ. In Romans chapter 6, we're looking at verse 4. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore, we're buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We're identified with him. He took our place that we might come to his place. He gave up his life that we might receive his life. He gave up his freedom that we might become free in him. And now we are new by the newness we find in Christ. Oh, offered for ownership by Christ. We don't belong to ourselves anymore. We come into the kingdom. Our Savior who gave his life and who has given that life to us now, we now come to him and we offer ourselves to be totally owned by him. Offered for ownership by Christ. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're looking at verse 19. It says, Watch, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Somebody comes to Christ. He understands now. He cannot use his hands like he wants. He does doesn't belong to him. His feet to go anywhere that he likes because they don't belong to him. His eyes, his ears, his mind, his brain, just for anything. He cannot carry his body now and carry it to their idol shine. Don't you know now that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God and ye are not your own. In verse 20, in verse 20 it says, for ye are bought with a price, the price of the blood of the Lamb. Wherefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. A P, possessed of the peace of Christ. P, you are possessed now of the peace of Christ, the turmoil is gone. The confusion is gone. The harassment of the devil, the condemnation is gone. We now possess the peace of Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 14, it says, For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. In verse 15, it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man so making a peace and then in verse 16 it says and that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile both Jerusalem and Nineveh both the Jews and the Gentiles unto God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereby and then in verse 17 and came and preached Peace to you, which were afar off, and to them 
that were nice and then kill a kill were quickened by the quickening of Christ were quickened were made alive or dead and buried and everything was down no sound no movement we could not move in the direction of the will of God because we were dead but now Christ the quickening spirit came upon us and were quickened by the quickening of Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 1, and you are see quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, even when we are dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved, are righteous through the redemption of Christ. Righteous through the redemption of Christ. In Romans chapter 3, we're looking at verse 23. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then in verse 24, it says, being justified freely. We don't pay anything. We don't pay with tears. We don't pay with agony. We don't pay with money. We pay nothing for salvation. He paid it all. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Looking at verse 25, it says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission, removal, and cleansing of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And then he tells us in verse 26, and he says to declare, I say, at this time is righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus is saved through the sacrifice of Christ. Saved through the sacrifice of Christ. In First Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 7, First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be new lamb as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, a Passover, is sacrificed for us. Christ, a Passover, and when I see his blood, I will pass over you. In the land of Egypt, they slew the lamb. They slew the king and they put the blood on the lintels of their houses. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now Christ has shed his blood for us. And when I see his blood, I will pass over you. For Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. T, transformed by the truth of Christ. T, transformed by the truth of Christ. In John chapter 8, reading from verse 32, and you shall know the truth, the truth with capital T, the truth, the one that came from heaven, and you shall know him. You will know his sacrifice, you will know his substitution, you will know his salvation, and you will know his sufficiency, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He makes it very clear in verse 36, in verse 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. You are free through Christ in Jesus' name. You upright through the upholding of Christ. He is the one that saves. He is the one that also upholds us. He says we are upright through the upholding of Christ. Hebrews chapter 1, we're looking at verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1, we're reading from verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding 
upholding all things, all things on earth, all things up, all things now, all men, all things, everyone, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself himself without the help of an angel himself without the help of any human being when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of majesty on high that is what upholds us the virtuous through the virtue of christ virtuous through the virtue of Christ. He knew when he was on earth, the virtue was gone out of him. And anytime you touch him by faith, in the virtue of Christ comes to your heart, comes to your life. We're told in Second Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 3, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. Then in verse 4, it says, whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through laws. We now live on the basis of his virtue and will become virtuous. W, whitened by the washing of Christ. Whitened. He washes us and he makes us white. We're told in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse each by the washing of water by the word. That washing comes from him. That word comes from him. Well, the washing of water by the word. In verse 27, it says that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any sort thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. X, X straight by the X-ray of Christ. X-ray by the X-ray, X-ray of Christ. In John chapter 21, reading from verse 17. John chapter 21, verse 17, he saith unto him, the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him, The third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. All things past, all things present, all things future. All things in the mind, all things in the spirit, all things in the heart. What the extreme of Men, medical people cannot detect the attitude, the disposition, and the total turning unto the Lord, the mind, the spirit, the heart. I don't mean the heart that pumps blood, the real heart out of which are the issues of life. God, Christ, knows all things. And he x -rays us. He says, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Why yielded under the yoke of Christ? Yielded under the yoke of Christ. Christ in Matthew chapter 11 reading from verse 29 Matthew 11 29 take my yoke upon you now when a sinner comes out of the world out of sin the yoke of Satan he abandons he removes that yoke and that togetherness with the sinful society that is devoted to Satan he now takes the yoke 
the principle, the life, the control of Christ upon him. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. In Bastachi, it says, for my yoke is easy, and my body is light. Zed, zealous with the zeal of Christ, zealous with the zeal of Christ in the past. The sinner had been zealous for the things of this world, for the things that are temporal, for the things that are meaningless. Now he comes to Christ, and Christ has become his Savior, and Christ has become his all in all. Because of that, he takes on the zeal of Christ, and is zealous of good works. All the time he had missed, all the opportunities he had missed in doing good, he says now, I'm in Christ, I have forgiveness i have freedom now i'm in christ i'm built on the foundation now i am in christ i have the grace i have the gift i have the ability for goodness and because of that now we've zeal it launches out like paul the apostle so that it can reverse if possible so that he can do for god now much more than he did for the devil that's why it says in titus chapter 2 reading from verse 14 Titus chapter 2 verse 14 who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people a peculiar person a peculiar prophet a peculiar preacher now zealous of good works i pray all these revelations on the salvation of the lord from a to z will be reproduced in your life Amen. reproduced in my life is by grace and that grace to you is sufficient for you today let's rise up now and talk to the lord in prayer see the revelation of the lord and see what he has revealed concerning the source of salvation the sacrifice for salvation and the substance of our salvation and the grace of god multiply all through your life Lord, 